when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. <clears throat> God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, and he. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he had talked with the woman, and yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way to the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of the word this morning. Thank you. Amen. Many congregations are gathering, and they're gathering today. And perhaps they're gathering around the well, you know. But the, the thing is that we lack a spiritual oneness. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're gathered together, we're in a union, but what does it take to experience worship? It's like the story that I was just told by a uh, a friend of mine who was a minister of another organization, they call him Catholic. And he said, there were six people marooned on the desert. Two were Jewish, two were Catholic, and two were from a Baptist background. The Jews founded the Temple Emmanuel. The two Catholics organized the Church of the Holy Name. And the two, <laughs> the two from the Baptist background organized the first independent and the second independent Baptist church. You know, unity in anything is a bit hard to describe, but what the Puritan minister Roger Williams said back in the 1600s is pretty clear. Listen to this. We find not in the gospel that Christ hath anywhere provided for the uniformity of churches, but only for their unity. Nowhere in the gospel does it provide for uniformity, but only for, say it, go ahead, unity. unity. When you reply, that, that, that encourages me to know that I've got your attention. And God's, this, and God's working on you. Now, I want you to know that sounds great, but you know what? That, how does unity come about? How, in a separatist society, in a, in a, a, a society that wants to wants to, uh, I'll say, elevate the ind individual. It's interesting because, you know, our country is kind of kind of split right now because you got this socialist movement, but you also have this movement to make everybody feel good about themselves. Maybe that's the ploy of the socialists to begin with. That's all my politics for today. Let's get back to the work. As someone wisely once pointed out, you can take a dog and a cat and you can tie the tails together and throw them over the fence. And you'll have you yes, and you'll have a union, but you'll have no unity. Come on now, somebody say you understand what I'm saying there. Unfortunately, many congregations, as they worship, they experience union, but not unity. The people are gathered together because we need to be together. Not listen, they do not have a spirit of oneness. But what does it take to experience unity in worship? See, here's the thing. From the words of Jesus, we learn that unity in worship occurs when worshipers share a common focus. And the common focus is in Jesus. When we focus upon the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so let's take a look at his words. The first thing that we discover is that we are to worship in Christ. As I had up on the board a moment ago, we see Jesus sitting at this well. A Samaritan woman came to get water in verses 7 through 9. And Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? <laughs> Understand that she knew her place. She knew that she was a Samaritan and he was a Jew. That was not socially acceptable in them days. But here's Jesus saying, give me a drink. You see, Jews did not associate with those Samaritans. 
It was a double scandal in those days. A man speaking to a woman in public, a Galilean speaking to a Samaritan. Boy, was that double, that was double taboo right there. Galileans and Samaritans, they were bitter enemies and they avoided each other like the plague. Yet Jesus talked to him. Listen, he talked to this woman longer than he often talked to some of his disciples. And any of the accusers or anyone else in his family, as Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked for you to give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you a drink of water. If you only knew who you were talking to, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So what did we learn from this, this, this brief scene in Scripture in the Gospel? We learned that worship is no longer an issue of pedigree, but it, is a, but it is an issue of unity. Amen? Can you say amen? Amen. Even if you didn't listen. That's why it's on the wall. That's why it's in your bulletin. See, worship's not a matter of heritage. It's not a matter of what family you were born into, your background. It's not a matter of denomination. It's not a matter of race or creed. Worship's not about that which makes us different. Let me tell you, it's not about that which makes us different. It's not about the difference. It's what brings us together in unity. And if we're going to worship, let's worship in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. It's not about uh, <laughs> reputations or character or degrees of education. Listen, I know some people with higher learning that have never accomplished anything in their life other than going to school. But I also know some that are accomplishing some great things. Amen? It's not about the degree of sinfulness. You sin more or less. No, it doesn't matter. It's not about the level of sinfulness because here came the one. His name is Jesus. He came to take away the sin of the world. And there's no sin too great that he cannot come and take away. And it's not necessarily a case of holiness either. Some of you think, well, you know what? Who are they to worship? They're not, they're not a holy person. Can I tell you that you'll never be a holy person yourself until you realize that, that listen, come on now, somebody. Until you come to worship in spirit and truth, you'll never be holy. It's about the sinless holy one. It's not about your sin. It's not about how holy I am or am I not. Thank God. It's about, that, oh wait, it's not about your past. It's not even about where you are right at this minute, except that you're here and you have an opportunity right now to once again focus on Jesus. Worship is about this. It's about encountering life in Jesus Christ. You see, we, we come to encounter Jesus. Is that what you came for? A.W. Tozer wrote his book called The Pursuit of God. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other? Let me repeat that for you. 100 pianos, all tuned to the same tuning fork, are automatically tuned to each other. They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be any other way. Were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for a closer fellowship with each other, they would not be true worshipers. We do need each other. We do. By design. And by God's desire. That we would worship together in spirit and in, in truth. Lord, I hope I do this message justice today. And I hope that there are hearts ready to receive it, ears ready to hear it. And believers in Jesus that are ready to listen and do what it says. You see, the tuning takes place. And it only takes place. Listen to what I'm telling you. 
The tuning takes place as we encounter Jesus.